Let's see, so we had an introduction already to the Kronecker factor, which we will see um, again featuring. So what I want to talk about, at least at first, is to give you an example of what I mean, what I meant yesterday by a structural theorem. And for this, uh, we will look at the following average, t to the n f1, t to the 2n f2. And it turns out that the structure that's important for this average is exactly the Kronecker factor that was introduced. But the point of view will be a little bit different than, than what, we'd, uh, what was just discussed in the previous talk. This, just to put it in context, this corresponds, um, if you're proving some Reddy's theorem, this corresponds to arithmetic progressions at length 3, which is Roth's theorem. Because if I take this to be the indicator function of a set A and then integrate, then I will have measure of A intersect T to the N, A intersect T to the 2 N A. And so that's how you get um, length three progressions. So one of the things that I pointed out yesterday in the mean ergodic theorem or in the pointwise ergodic theorem is that if your system is ergodic, and I will always assume um, that my system is ergodic, by ergodic decomposition for the kinds of problems that we're considering, we can reduce to, to this setting. Much of what I will say can be extended to the non-ergodic case in defining factors that control things in the non-ergodic setting, but it's more complicated. Um, and, but this theory has been developed in the last few years. So, um, but for now, I will just assume ergodicity. But even with an assumption of ergodicity, these averages are more complicated than in the mean ergodic theorem in the following sense. The limit, and the mean ergodic theorem is constant. It's the integral of f. It's the projection down to the invariance, the invariance being trivial. You get the integral of the function when I'm just looking at a single term. But when I'm doing this, um, even if it's ergodic, well, uh, the, the double average is not constant, even if I started off with an ergodic rotation. So even with the simplest system that I'm looking at. So, um, so if my system is the torus, and Tx is equal to x plus alpha mod 1, and it's ergodic, so alpha is irrational, um, then you can write down examples just to easily illustrate that this will not be constant. And let's see, I wrote down some example here, and maybe you'll have to check it if it works, but e to the 4 pi i x for f1 and f2 of x uh, I'll take to be e to the minus 2 pi i x. And now, assuming I've done this correctly, you can compute what happens if I do t to the nf, uh, and then I should get a relation here, and the relation that I'm hoping comes out of this is f1 of t to the nx times f2 of t to the 2 nx is always equal to f2 inverse. So. The point of this being that if I want to compute this double average, I'm not just going to get some constant as the answer. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, check it. <laughs> uh, I, yes, today jet lag kicked in. You know, yesterday was fine. But, you know. Anyway, so. Um, more generally, if, if you're going to compute this average for an ergodic rotation, if you're going to do this, then what you should get, this should converge to the integral, I guess, over the circle of f1 of x plus t, f2 of x plus 2t. So my only point in, in bringing this up is to say there has to be more complicated behavior here. You can't just hope to project down to the invariance and say, OK, I know what the answer to this, to this convergence problem is. So I will use various properties of conditional expectation, most of which uh, Marcus introduced. So uh, the point of view, again, I will say is a little bit different. So I'm going, and I will use factors, all of which I do not really want to re-review the definitions, because I think you've all seen them within the last couple of days. Um, but you know, the conditional expectation, I want to just think about this as the L2 operator um, of projection down onto some measurable factor, some measurable sigma algebra. 
um, and various characterizations that I'll use that, for example, if I integrate the conditional expectation of a function, that that's the same as the integral of the function, very various basic properties, all of which Marcus outlined for us very nicely. Um, but factors, I will just spend one minute um, just to, to use, I guess, my notation and introduce what I would like to, to use about them is mostly I will view factors. Um, my system is x, always with the sigma algebra, curly x, mu t. And I want to view a factor as a t invariant sub sigma algebra of this. Um, so this is, this is no different than viewing it as a separate system. I could write this as y, uh, curly y, nu s to be completely clear, and my original system being x uh, mu t. And I didn't leave much room for the factor map pi going in between these two systems. But the factor map is just something, I guess I'll draw the picture to, to intertwine the dynamics. And down here's s. I will call all the maps t, whether they're s or t or anything else. Just um, this is the only time that I will be very, very careful about writing this. OK. So I can view this as an invariant. A factor can be defined in one of several equivalent ways. One is an invariant sigma algebra. Another as a system. Just pull it back under here to see the invariant sigma algebra. Another as a subalgebra of L infinity functions. Um, so any of these, I will uh, uh, t invariant, of course, of algebra of the bounded functions. And I will freely go between these when I want to talk about a factor. So um, let's see. The simplest way to construct factors would be just to take the product of two systems. And then each of the systems, the original systems, is a factor of the product system. This will not be so interesting for us. The first interesting factor is exactly the Kronecker factor that was introduced. Let me give an explicit example, is if I'm looking at the two torus, and if my map is xy maps to x plus alpha y plus x, this system will come up several times. Well, sitting inside here is a factor which depends on all of the functions that only depend on the first coordinate. So the rotation x maps to x plus alpha, the rotation system that I wrote down over there, is a factor of this system. OK. Um, Another factor that we may have time to discuss a bit would be the periodic factor. So the periodic factor is, uh, well, maybe it's easiest to view it in terms of the functions. The periodic factor is the closure of all, um, I guess I'll write it down as, hmm, oh yeah, let's do it this way, all functions such that there exists some m such that t to the m f is equal to f, and I better take the closure of such functions, of bounded functions. Um, this, the periodic factor, so sometimes called the rational Kronecker factor, it's the one that captures the rational eigenvalues. Okay, more generally, the Kronecker factor is, I can view it as the almost periodic factor. Um, and it contains all of these guys. Okay, so those will be some that would come up. As was pointed out also in the last lecture, this structure versus randomness, the Kronecker factor, the opposite of the Kronecker factor is randomness, weakly mixing. Um, so so uh, I don't know, I don't think there was a definition put on the board of weak mixing. There are many different equivalent. So the system x, okay, with the sigma algebra measure and so on, is weakly mixing. Um, perhaps I will give not the traditional definition, but if for all measurable sets um, that you can move points from one into the other at the same time. So for all measurable sets, I guess they better be positive measure. So I'll say measure of A, measure B, measure of C, positive, that there exists some N such that the measure of A intersect T to the NB times the measure of A intersect T to the NC is positive. I can simultaneously move things. I guess if it's not invertible, I should be careful, but I will assume everything is invertible. 
Okay, meaning I can simultaneously move things from one to the other. It's a nice exercise to prove that this is equivalent to perhaps the standard definition that you usually see in terms of taking the average um, and the absolute value of the average approaching um, zero or equivalent to the product being ergodic in the system of itself. So maybe it's useful to have an example of a system which has rotational behavior, i.e. is not gonna be weakly mixing, but just to see what these double averages do. So I've already said, if you were a rotation, what they do, and to computation to check that. But let me hmm, give you an explicit example. So I will give you, a, well, sort of explicit. For what happens to these double averages if my system has some rotational behavior, but I'm able to actually compute what the averages are. So let me say, let's say my system splits into having some rotational behavior by three. So rotation into three pieces. And so that I'll be able to, let's assume that t of x1 is x2, t of x2 is x3, and of course t of x3 should bring me back. So there's some three rotation moving in this system, moving pieces around. And let me further assume that if t cubed restricted to each xi is going to be weakly mixing so that I can easily compute the averages. Okay, so then what happens if I take points and I start looking at the double average, for example, um, f1 of t to the nx, f2 of t to the 2nx. Well, let me look at points, for example, in x1. If I take x's in x1, well, what happens to them? A third is, it matters their behavior mod three. Okay, so um, this will approach, I guess, so uh, the first term, if it's in x1 and it looks at the, yeah, zero mod three, then it'll come back to x1 by my assumption and because it's weak mixing, the averages will converge to the product of the integrals. So I will get integral of x1, f1, d mu times integral f2. And the one, uh, the one mod three behavior, it goes from x1 to x2, so I'll get the integral of f1, I guess, on x2, and integral of f2 on x3. And the third term, the two mod three terms, will reverse these. And you can make an obvious change in the indices if x is in x2 or if it's in x3. Okay, so the point of this is, is example is that the average, these double averages, even though this is not a pure rotation, it depends solely on this rotational behavior is what's going on here. Okay, it's not a, a rotation system, it's not a purely weakly mixing system, but it's, it, it lacks, um, this is not a weak mixing system, so it has a non-trivial rotational factor, a non-trivial Kronecker factor, and that's exactly the, the point of the, of these, when these double averages is that that's what controls their behavior, is what the rotational behavior that's going on here. So uh, maybe now I should give a formal definition of, of of uh, the Kronecker factor. Um, and I could give the equivalent definition in terms of the eigenfunctions, as was done in the previous talk. It is, the Kronecker factor is the sub-sigma algebra that's spanned by the eigenfunctions, but this will not really help us in doing these computations. What will help us is the fact that it has a very particular geometric and group structure, and that's the content of the Hamos von Neumann theorem. Um, so, so none of this is, is, a, is new, right? But this is the factor, Z, so Z1, uh, we'll write it as Z1, a compact abelian group. And on the compact abelian group, my transformation looks like a rotation. The sigma algebra, curly Z1, using my convention that's always the same as the associated Borel sigma algebra. You have Haar measure on this, and the transformation, I will write it, because it's a compact abelian group, I'll just write it additively. Usually, more generally, I will use multiplicative notation, but to indicate this, okay? So every eigenfunction of the system comes, um, arise from the Kronecker factor. And 
Let's see. Well, right here is one example of a Kronecker factor. It's this factor, the, the things, that coordinate, things that depend on the first. More complicated, I could do something like on the three torus, have the map x, y, z maps to x plus alpha, y plus x, uh, y plus z, for example. This would be a system on the three torus that also has the same Kronecker factor as this system. Um, and do, you can do, again, at each point, the Kronecker factor, it will be the largest abelian group. So, and in fact, the Kronecker factor should really be defined as the largest. It contains every other group rotation. So it's the largest compact abelian group factor of the, um, okay. Now what have I done with the eraser? Okay. So, um, you allow, if you allow, if you take into account this rotational behavior, well, one thing is if I'm looking at this double average, if I'm looking at this double average, one of the things that, that you know is that if I project down to this rotation factor, I better take into account what's going on there in order to understand this double average. Meaning there's an obvious constraint is that if for mu almost every x in here, when I project the triples, x t to the nx, t to the 2nx, when I project it down to the Kronecker factor, it better look like something like x, well, projection of x, x tilde, uh, x tilde plus n alpha, x tilde plus 2 and alpha. Meaning that in the Kronecker factor, there is some constraint that has to be there that comes up from these triples. And when the transformation projects down to a rotation, so if here's my whole system, and down here is the Kronecker, um, where the transformation now looks like x maps to x plus alpha, what happening x mapping to tx, this has to project down to to the images looking like that. It should be in kid and x tilde in the Kronecker factor. And um, what Furstenberg proved in his 77 paper was that this obvious constraint, that you must have these triples constrained when you look down at them in the, in the Kronecker factor, this obvious constraint is the only constraint on these averages. That this Kronecker factor is what's really controlling uh, what's going on for the double averages. So, I see several people yesterday asked me if I could give a very explicit example of a structural theorem. And this, I would, the, the simplest structural theorem would be the von Neumann ergodic theorem, which says that the structure is the invariant sigma algebra, the structure that controls those average. But that doesn't really tell us much. The first really non-trivial one is this, which was proved in Furstenberg's paper, which is that the Kronecker factor is the, really the first non-trivial factor. So let me state this carefully. So um, I'm going to assume that the system is ergodic. And let's write it as z. So you'll see I've been writing it as z1. This is a hint that there are, there's a series of factors that are coming. I actually will not talk so much about the series of factors, so let me just write this as Z, curly Z, M, T is the Kronecker factor. Um, take bounded functions, F1, F1, F2. And then uh, this is an, L2 equality from the limit, so let's write this as the sum t to the n f1, t to the 2 n f2, minus the same thing where I project each of the functions down to the Kronecker factor. So same sum, t to the n expectation of f on z, f1 on z, t to the 2 n expectation of f2 on z, so the same average. So that this in L2, it's an L2. So my, by definition for me, the Kronecker is the maximal factor. 
always. Yeah, I wanted to capture all of the rotational behavior. Okay, uh, so this tends to zero as n tends to infinity. So what this says to reinterpret this theorem is it says that if you want to compute this average, it suffices to project each of the functions down here into the Kronecker factor and compute this average. These two limits, this one exists if and only if this one exists, and when they exist, they are equal. It's a way to think of this. Now, because this is a compact abelian group over here, it is the Kronecker factor, we're allowed to use Fourier analysis, and computing this is a nice exercise to do, to compute the, the averages here using Fourier analysis. The hard part of this is to say, okay, this is the right thing to do. This is where you want to go. Okay, so once we get here, we still have to prove convergence, right? This just says that this one exists if and only if that one exists and the two limits are the same. But once you're here, if you know that this is an abelian group, convergence is, is the easy part in this problem. Okay, so how do, you prove how do you prove this theorem? I guess I'll give you a brief outline of it. This requires the van der Korpet lemma. Um, and I don't know, I thought for once I'd give a series of talks without saying the van der Korpet lemma, but no, I don't think I can do it. So, so I will introduce it. So the van der Korpet lemma was widely used in number theory for proving things like equidistribution results and uniform distribution. Um, and Vitali introduced it in ergodic theory, uh, uh, imported it to prove the polynomial ergodic theorem. Um, and, and this is, so let me state it. I guess I'll state it in general. We're only going to apply this to the unitary operator, but if un, there's no difference to prove it or state it um, in general. If we take a sequence in a Hilbert space that's bounded, so I'll just uniformly bound them by, by one. Um, for all n. If we set gamma n to be the limit, uh, I guess I should be careful in case the limit does not exist, the lim soup of the averages where, where you average over a window. So these are um, the inner product of un plus h un. Take the average. So this is, uh, I guess this should be gamma h. So if these averages, uh, if this is gamma n by definition, then if I want to compute the averages of the UNs, the ones that I really would like to understand the average, then in L2, they're bounded by the averages of the gammas. So lim soup, uh, one over h, sum gamma h. And each one of these is the appropriate summations. This from this one's over n, and this one is over h, okay? It's not hard to prove. Um, it's an argument in estimating and using convexity. So, but how does this come in to the convergence type results that, that, that I was saying here? Well, First of all, without loss of generality, and this is back to proving Furstenberg's theorem, I can assume that the projection of one of these functions on the Kronecker is zero. Okay, subtract off the integral of the function otherwise. But so without loss of generality, I can assume the expectation of, uh, let's say, F1 on the Kronecker factor is zero. Okay, and then we're gonna apply this criterion for showing convergence. Okay, the advantage of doing zero is that I just show this side is zero, therefore that side is zero. Makes life just a little bit easier. And so um, the way to do this is to use the unitary operator. So you're gonna set un to be equal to t to the n, um, t to the n f1, t to the two n f2. Okay, and so then what do I need to do? I need to look at this, these gammas that are defined by this by looking at un inner product with un plus h. In fact, I don't even need the complicated, the full, the full strength of this that's stated there. But when I look at this, un, un plus h, well, writing it out, I get t to the n f1, t to the 2n f2, t to the n plus h 
f1 t to the 2n plus 2h f2. I should be careful and put some bars somewhere um, to make this actually correct. Okay, and so when I do this, now use the fact, you know, I'm just going to assume everything's real valued. I'll get all the bars wrong. Yeah, yeah doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, so now use the fact that it's a measure preserving and hit everything with t to the n or t to the minus n. And so this will become, let me collect terms, uh, hit this with t to the n, this becomes f1 t to the f1 t to the h f1, and the second term is t to the n times f2 t to the 2h f2. Okay, so what I've done is I've hit everything with minus n, so I get n n, remove the n and n, and so I think I've, good. yeah, I think it's good. You were looking at me like I was, <laughs> which is very possible. Oh. You know, today I'm very slow, which makes me talk faster, so you have to slow me down. This, yes, that's correct. This, this argument is directly from Furstenberg's paper, I'm so far, but it's a nice illustration of what you need to do in general. Now, what have we gotten down to here is that you'll see that all of the only occurrence of n is here. That's the whole advantage. The only occurrence of n is here, which means that if I take the average over n, the limit 1 over n, un, un plus h, these guys, this limit exists, okay? In fact, it's, and uh, yeah, by the ergodic theorem, this limit exists, and I can write down explicitly what the limit is. It's equal to the integral f1 t to the h f1. That's my first term, yeah. And the second term, I better project down, so I'll write this as p2, f2, t to the 2h, f2. So this is the projection now down onto the invariance. Okay, so. So because I assumed it was ergodic, this projection, this is down to, this is constant. Um, and because I assumed that the expectation of f on, f1 on on the Kronecker factor was zero, that's telling me that f is now orthogonal to the constant functions, so this whole integral is zero. And then you apply the van der Korput lemma and complete it. So I'm you know, omitting a few further details, but, but there's a hint here of what to do in general um, for dealing with more general averages, is that you need to, if I now want to take this and look at more terms, t to the nf1, t to the 2nf2, t to the 3nf3, et cetera, is that you need to find an appropriate factor under which you can project all of the functions so that now on this factor I have equality in the L2 sense, meaning that this limit exists if and only if this exists, and when they both exist, the two are equal. And then once I have found that, I need to be able to have some structure, because here what I said, and I didn't write down the proof for, I said that once you're here in the Kronecker factor, it's easy because you can use Fourier analysis. So I need some kind of description of the factor that I'm going to project everything down to to be able to use it, to be able to prove convergence, if that's the ultimate goal. You can also use it to prove recurrence, to prove whatever other of the statements that we talked about yesterday, um, depending on what the goal is. Okay. So the first thing is um, that well, you might naively hope that you can just keep projecting down to the Kronecker factor and that this will help, but unfortunately, the Kronecker factor doesn't capture the behavior as soon as you go to more terms. Ah, you still have vendor corporate, and this trick will come up every time to do something like this, but it'll become more complicated, but let me give you an example why. Sorry? Oh, and I didn't finish the computation either, though, so. Yeah, all things on the board should be averaged. <laughs> That's a general meta theorem. Okay, so. What if I looked at, so, so Karma, your question, like why, why, can't, I, why can't I do this? So um, 
what if I have a generalized eigenfunction? So I have some function f such that f of tx is equal to f of x, little f of x times big f of x, where little f is going to be an eigenfunction, an actual eigenfunction. OK, some lambda. Uh, so this is an eigenfunction, but this, eigen, this, this capital F is a generalized eigenfunction, meaning when I apply t to it, I don't just get a constant times, but I get this. Then, well, um, if you want to, then you can write out, iterate this, and compute what is f of t to the nx. And, well, maybe, so this will be f of x, f of tx f of t to the n minus 1x. And this morning, uh, I probably need an f of x there. And this morning, I realized that some of my computations were completely wrong, so I'm hoping I changed them correctly. <laughs> so this should be give me a quadratic term in this, uh, f of x to the n times f of x. Maybe there's f of n. Oh, there's n terms. OK, so what does this mean? This means that if I look at f of x, it will give me a relation. Remember what I said about the triples, x, t to the n, x, t to the 2 n, x. That, what that told me is that there was a non-trivial relation in the Kronecker between x, x plus n alpha, x plus 2 n alpha. Well, here, this is going to be a non-trivial relation that's going to involve four terms rather than three terms. Why? Because if this computation is correct, I should get f of uh, t to the n, x, the first term cubed. Second term, f of t to the 2nx mm, to the minus 3. And the third term, f of t to the 3nx. And if this is not the exact one, then something very similar should work. But the point here is that now there's a relationship in quadruples, x, t to the n, x, t to the 2nx, t to the 3nx. OK? It's a non-trivial relation that you have to take into account when you want to compute this average, the average with more terms than just the two, two terms that we looked at. OK? This kind of relationship did not arise in the Kronecker, because in the Kronecker factor, once you know x, t to the nx, t to the 2nx, you already knew x to 3nx. Right? That was determined already. So there has to be more than just the Kronecker factor that's controlling this. And this is exactly where um, the nil factors come into play. OK, is that they're, they're the other factors. So I should give you some examples of a nil system, but you know I already have. OK, you didn't, it wasn't called that. But on the two torus, the map xy maps to x plus alpha y plus x is one of the simplest examples of a nil system. Okay, um, It's easy to check when this guy is ergodic, and ergodicity is exactly equivalent to alpha being irrational, just like um, in the Kronecker factor. So it suffices to check ergodicity. But this kind of system is exactly what gives rise to quadratic behavior. Because what happens when you look at the iterates? What happens in this term? When you iterate, the first term just looks like x plus n alpha. Right, so and, and terms. But the second term, if I iterate this, um, I should get y uh, plus nx plus n times n minus 1 over 2 alpha, up to n being n plus 1 or n minus 1. OK? But you get, when, when you evaluate, you get a quadratic term coming from the fact that you keep adding alpha, and then you add 2 alpha, so alpha, 3 alpha, et cetera. You keep adding that to it. And when you get quad quadratic expressions like this, they do not arise from rotations. Okay, I can't take a rotation and, and turn it into something quadratic like this. Okay, so um, the In, in the work that I, well, I briefly mentioned yesterday, um, in the work with Host, I guess this is how we phrased it 10 years ago. But I will give you a new phrasing that I hope it, with, that's much more recent in a few minutes. But um, 
the way I will phrase this theorem is to say that characteristic factors, and I will define that precisely, for a multiple ergodic average, and this is just the average t to the n f1 t to the kn fk, just the average is I'm, I'm going to, it's true more generally, but I'm just going to phrase this for the averages um, for, for uh, along arithmetic progressions. Um, and I guess I will add it in polynomial, polynomials, um, the polynomial expressions that I had on the board yesterday. The characteristic factors for these are inverse limits of nil systems. Okay, so let me now just make sure we understand what all these words are. Characteristic factors means exactly in the sense that we had on the board that I can take this average, this thing, and I can replace each function, each fi, by its conditional expectation down on some factor, I'll call it z, k minus one here. Okay, so each one of these in this, and they, this replacement happens in L2 in the same sense that was in Furstenberg's theorem. So that meaning, in order to understand this limit, it suffices to replace each function by its conditional expectation on some factor. That's called the characteristic factor. And this factor has the structure of an inverse limit of nil systems. I will define exactly nil systems, but that'll take me a few minutes to, to explain. Um, inverse limits, luckily, Marcus gave us a nice exposition of inverse limits and their properties, and so I will just... That's true. Right, but it was every property I needed. Yep, no, no, it's, oh, that's good. Yeah, no, no, I agree, I agree. Um, so, okay, so nil systems. I need to define what a general nil system is. You've already seen the simplest nil system, the abelian one, that's a nil system of order one. The Kronecker is the, the, the first one. Other than nil systems, are there any questions so far? Can you take a minute? Okay, we'll do the five-minute crash course and everything you need to know about nilpotent groups and co-compact subgroups. Okay, so if G, I'm going to assume that G is a k-step nilpotent Lie group. Okay, and by this, well, let me just define for, uh, for the, I will write the commutator A, B is A inverse B inverse A, B for elements A, B, and G. And it's k-step nilpotent if, and if I, let's see, G, I should keep to my same notation if G0 or G1 is G. Hmm. I don't think I wrote it down. Okay. <laughs> I don't think it matters, but let's just say G1 is G. And G i plus one will be, by definition, the commutator of G with G i, um, where this means take all the, the commutators a, b, a in G, and b in G i. And G is k-step nilpotent if G k plus one reduces down to the identity element of G, okay? So that's what I mean by k-step nilpotent. Abelian groups are one step. So let me just check. Yes, this corresponds to with what I want is one step should be abelian. Um, and a general a two-step, well, the one to keep in mind is the Heisenberg group. So this is upper triangular matrices with ones on the diagonals and entries in R. That's a, the, the example you should keep in your mind as to what's a two-step nilpotent group, okay? Now, I said that these are nil systems, so I have to turn this into a system. The first thing to do is to turn it into a manifold. Um, so gamma will be discrete, discrete, and co-compact subgroup. 
of it so that when I quotient, I can take the quotient and I will quotient on the right so that I can act by the group on the left. And I will get some x, which is uh, compact. And this is the definition of a nil manifold. So k-step nilpotent Lie group modded out by a discrete co-compact subgroup. So now um, g acts naturally on x by left translation, meaning if I fix an element in G, I can multiply um, the cosets. Uh, so let's fix, I'll uh, call it tau in G, and then if tau times G gamma is equal to tau acts on G gamma, taking it to tau G gamma. I will not write these cosets as G gamma ever again. Okay, there'll be, this will take x to tau x, that x is a coset g gamma. Okay. Um, so a rotation, again, if, if this is the torus, so, so it's r mod z, then you're just talking about a rotation, and I would write it additively as x maps to x plus alpha, multiplying on the left. Okay, um, so if I take a, such a system, x is equal to g mod gamma with the associated Borel sigma algebra, which I'll omit, with the Haar measure, so mu will be Haar measure, uh, and the transformation t is equal to um, rotation by sub fixed element tau, then this is exactly what I mean by a null system. So a whole system is an inverse limit of these, uh, an inverse limit of a sequence uh, of nil systems if each of the terms in the inverse limit is a nil system for the same k. I'm not allowed to change this step. So you take, so what I would like is the statement uh, inverse limit of k step nil systems, but k is fixed. Okay, you're not allowed to raise k as you take your inverse limit. Okay. So an inverse limit of one step nil systems, abelian is just still a compact abelian group, but when you get to two step already, if you take an inverse limit, well, you get more complicated behavior from the inverse limit. It's not even necessarily, it's certainly not necessarily two step, but it's actually not even necessarily a homogeneous space. Okay, so I've actually got two examples on the board Let's, let's stick with the Heisenberg, um, the discrete co-compact gamma. If this is my G that I want to take, then I could take this to be the lattice of entries in Z, upper triangular matrices with ones on the diagonal entries in Z, and form G mod gamma. And this would be the, the Heisenberg two-step nilpotent nil system. Um, I then need to multiply by some fix some element, alpha, beta, gamma, over in G sorry, over there, and multiply that by that, okay? So the multiplication, um, x prime, y prime, z prime, what this does is it gives me, this is x plus x prime, this is just matrix multiplication, but I'm writing it out uh, plus the twist of x times y prime to see that you get this twisting factor coming in from the second one. So this is the multiplication that comes out in this group. Um, it's, a, it's an exercise to check uh, that you can give this, this guy is exactly one of these systems that we've already seen. It's isomorphic to T2, and the Kronecker factor will be the rotation by, if I fix this, multiplication by some, oh, I better be careful. Uh, it'll be multiplication by alpha, beta, as long as, I, and it'll be ergodic if and only, I think, if I put alpha and beta here, because I would like these two to, to look like the rotation, the first two terms. So. You want the rationally independent of yes, yes, I need them to be rationally, to get ergodicity. Okay, so now I've defined the objects in the, in the statement, but I want to give you a different statement, a sort of a more modern version of this structure theorem. Because what that structure theorem says, this is in the theme of the structure and randomness that Marcus was talking about, is the structure theorem basically tells you that there's a decomposition of an arbitrary 
measure space into a, factor, uh, a, a structured part. And the structured part here are these inverse limits of nil systems. They're the generalization of the Kronecker factor. In fact, they sit above the Kronecker factor in a tower of factors. That's the structured part. And the, the non-structured part is some place where exactly as he said, it's random. Everything averages out and disappears, goes to zero there. But in order to, to, to rephrase that in a more of a, of a um, uh, I guess in more of a, I would call it more of a more recent understanding of how to view this and more of a complete uh, decomposition structure and randomness type result, I'm going to give you one more definition. Um, if I have a nil system, so I'll write this as g mod gamma, and the transformation is t, I'm omitting the measure and I'm omitting, um, and let's, let me write this as t is equal to the left multiplication by tau. I'm omitting the sigma algebra and the measure. If I take a function, uh, complex valued, real valued, um, and let me assume that this function is continuous. And now if I fix some x0 and I evaluate the function on this orbit, Okay, so this is, remember this is some, some coset, and what I'm doing is just left multiplying by this element tau. This is, and if this is k-step, nil system, this is what is called a k-step nil sequence. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm just taking a function, I'm evaluating, getting a sequence, f of t to the nx, um, for n, for the iterate. So uh, a k-step nil sequence, well, first of all, I can make some assumptions. I can always assume, for example, that x0 is the identity element for uh, the identity of the x. Some simplifications. I don't know that I'll actually even need that right now. Um, I can also make some assumptions about connectedness and simply connected things that will become easier for various applications. So, I, for example, I can assume that G is connected and simply connected. So if that makes you happier, you're welcome to make any assumptions you want on the nil system. But what is a one-step nil sequence? If it's a one-step nil sequence, then what are you doing? You're looking at the orbit in a compact abelian group. So this is an almost periodic sequence. One step. You know, sequence is the same as an almost periodic. So this idea of generalizing this to arbitrary and evaluating things on, uh, on a nil system um, and, and studying these nil sequences uh, came from an article jointly with Vitali and Bernard Host. Um, and I think that there will be several people who are speaking about nil sequences next week. And they come up in various contexts. The family of k-step nil sequences has lots of good properties uh, in the sense that it's a, um, here's a simple proposition, I guess. The family I'm almost out of time, but do I have five more minutes, maybe? What? Eight minutes, okay. So the family of k-step nil sequences, well, these are bounded functions. So it's a subalgebra, bounded sequences rather, bounded of uh, L infinity. Um, and it's closed under what you would want it to be closed under. So under complex conjugation and under shifting. And Okay, but the properties, the other, it's more difficult other than one step to write down exactly what they are. So for two step, there is a characterization. Um, there are various, I'll need more space. For two step, Let's look at what happened in the two-step case. Well, first, if we looked at that first system, the two-step system that was just x, y maps to x plus alpha, y plus x. It's an affine two-step nil system. In this case, it gives rise to 
um, sequences, when I evaluate them, it gives rise to sequences that look like e to the 2 pi i n times n minus 1 alpha over 2. These are the quadratic orbits that you see coming up in that second term, for example. Um, so this is the type of types of sequences that can arise there. But that's not all. There are other ones. For example, if I looked at the Heisenberg, I get more complicated sequences that can arise. Uh, I don't know if I want to write them down. They have to do with theta functions evaluated on it, but I could. <coughs> and there are more. There are more, for example, from the Heisenberg. I get products of theta functions um, um, from these ones. And what it turns out is at least for two steps, one can classify them. Oh, there's also the one-step ones, right? Don't forget the almost periodic ones, right? So those are certainly, by the definition, you also get these, the complex exponentials. So they are also close, close to the norm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm allowing two-step or less, right? So two-step includes one step. So um, you get these almost periodic sequences. You get these straight-up quadratic sequences, which come from simple two-step nil manifolds, the affine ones, and then you get more complicated ones coming from the Heisenberg. And this is um, Bernard Host and I classified these for two-step. For three-step, it's more complicated. There is no such simple classification that we know of of all of the, how to write down all of the, the nil sequences. Now, they, they arise, though, in many different contexts. They arise in studying multi-correlations, which this afternoon I will tell you a little bit about multi-correlations and how they're used in convergence problems. They arise in topological applications, and they arise heavily in additive combinatorics in proof of the inverse theorem of, of uh, Green, Tau, and Ziegler, um, so the inverse theorem for the Gower's norms. So let me, though, reformulate, uh, and I may reformulate without completely defining everything, but let me reformulate the, the structure theorem in terms of nil sequences. So, so remember the way I phrased the structure theorem before was it said that if you want to find a factor that controls the averages, there is something, what it is, is it's something that's an inverse limit of nil systems, right? So you have to project everything down to the appropriate step of inverse limits of nil systems. So again, this is just a rephrasing, but using this, this terminology. So uh, one can do this for non-ergodic, but there's a little bit more, so let me just assume. Um, Let's assume that the system is ergodic. Um, take a bounded function. Now we will have no averages in this statement. OK, so we've gone away from that. And fix a bounded function and epsilon. Then you can decompose this function. And so this will be more along the lines of the decomposition results that we heard about. So there exists a decomposition of the function f into, well, there's going to be a structured component, a random component, and a small error. That's the inverse limit part. OK, so this, the structured component will be called the uniform. The random component, uh, sorry, the, the unstructured, let me write it differently. Let's write this as the structured component. There's going to be a uniform part. That's the part that will average away. And then there's going to be an error part that will be small, depending on epsilon such that what happens? Well, the error part, the error, oops, error, the error term, is going to be small. Uh, this is an L1 error. OK, so that takes care of this term. The uniform part, the uniform part is the part that I said will average away, will disappear. It turns out there is a norm. I'm going to write it with three bars because I have not yet defined it. A norm, um, and this is the k plus first. I guess I have to fix a k for each k. This structure theorem works. So that this part will have zero norm. And the structured part, when I evaluate it, it's a k-step nil sequence. 
for almost every X. Yeah. So I'm fixing epsilon. This this term certainly depends on epsilon. This term does not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But so these norms do you involve, do they involve all kinds of averaging? So the norms are defined by averaging. Yes. So maybe I will just. Yes. It's it's moved the problem to somewhere else. Yeah. So the norms. In fact, they're not norms, they're semi-norms, and that's why I should be careful to, to state this. Um, the first, they're defined inductively. The first one is just the absolute value of the function. Um, and then maybe instead of writing down the general definition, I'll just write down the second one, and then we'll, you know, you'll see how to do the general one. So the second one to the fourth, the, the power is to make it subadditive. And there's something you need to prove here to show that it exists. This, this is the average of taking um, the previous guy always. So in this case, the previous guy is just the integral of f t to the n f d mu, squaring it and, and uh, averaging it. So more generally, what you do is if you want to define the kth plus first semi-norm, you raise it 2 to the k plus 1 power, and this will be the limit as n goes to infinity of the average of the previous norm shifted. So, and this is, hopefully you see in here a hidden van der Korpet from uh, a hidden van der Korpet idea, which was how the construction of these norms came up. Uh, I need a d integral. Uh, no, let me just write this as k. k the semi norm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're semi norms. Okay. I put it over here. Ah, yes, I do. I need a two to the power k here. Yeah, I put the one over. Okay, so the the idea of these things is the closer a semi norm is to zero, then uh, the more uniform it is, meaning the more random it is, is the idea of these norms. Okay, it makes it easier when they're zero, Fs are really easy to deal with. These, nor these semi-norms become norms if and only if the space is a nil manifold. It turns out so that's a hint of to why there's a nil, another hint of the nil structure. So I would view this as an ergodic analog of uh, the Green Tau Ziegler inverse theorem. So that's uh, there, they have a decomposition. The space is different, it's not, it's not an infinite space, they're working on Z mod and Z. The nil sequence, um, this structured term, the nil sequence is different. It's not a continuous function being evaluated, and they have to control the regularity of the nil sequence, so there are some other things that come into it. But it's a very similar result in the sense of a decomposition to a structured, a uniform, and a small error part um, in, in that sense. So um, what the relation between this and the previous one is that these semi-norms define factors of my system. And when these semi-norms are exactly another definition we could take is that these nil factors are exactly uh, where the semi-norm is zero. So the kth semi-norm, maybe it's the k plus first, uh, is exactly this collection of bounded functions such that the expectation on this factor that is defined by this is zero. That requires work. I mean, this is not, I'm saying things that, that need proof. Um, it's not, it shouldn't be obvious. But they can be used, these guys can be used to define the factors, and those are exactly the factors that are the inverse limits of nil systems that came up in the first version of the structure theorem. Okay, so I think with that, I will stop today, right now. Thank you.